Trust you've had a good week, profitable week. <clears throat> book of Joshua, chapter 2. This is going to be the sixth book in your Bible from the very beginning. Book of Joshua. This is uh, one of the great stories that we're going to tell a little bit here today uh, of the Scripture. If you are familiar with the Bible, even if you're just casually familiar with the Bible, you're, you're going to have heard, no doubt, the story of Joshua and uh, the Battle of Jericho. Did the walls really come tumbling down, right? And uh, there's a lot of stories like that in the Scriptures, not just particularly in that vein, but a lot of those kinds of unique stories. Of course, we have the story of Noah, and we'll look at some of the great stories in the coming weeks from Scripture here. But I want you to look with me at chapter 2 of the book of Joshua. I'm going to give you a little bit of a backdrop here before we read this chapter together. Uh, you'll know that Moses has written the first five books of your Bible, Genesis through Deuteronomy. As you end the book of Deuteronomy, what you find is that Moses, who's called the man of God, uh, Moses now is uh, gone to the top of a particular mountain, and the Lord said to Moses, you look out across the river, and you see all that land that I told Israel they're going to get. And Moses, you can see that's the inheritance, but you're not going to go across there. I've got another man for that job. And so the Lord took Moses, uh, and Moses died there at the top of that mountain. And uh, the next thing we have is we have a man who was called Moses Minister, a young man named Joshua. He's not young here, but he was young when he started off with Moses. And uh, Joshua had been kind of Moses' right-hand man. He is a general uh, in the army of Israel, uh, had fought with Amalek and some other nations as they crossed over uh, the wilderness wanderings for those 40 years. And now God has raised up Joshua to be the man that is going to lead the people of Israel uh, into the land of promise. And that's really where we pick it up here. Moses is gone, and Joshua now is just being uh, encouraged by God to be strong and uh, of a good courage uh, in this thing that he's got in front of him, which is going to be a massive task because now he's given to Joshua as the leader of the nation to not only get the, the people of Israel across the Jordan River, which the Bible says had overflowed its banks at that particular time, and so the, the river had swollen at that particular season of the year, and Joshua now had to get the nation across. But uh, Joshua now was in charge of the conquest of, uh, of this land and all of the, the king sort of nation states that were in all of this land that Israel had to overthrow so that they might take the possession of that which God had given to them. And so that's really where we pick up this story. And uh, we're going to read chapter 2 and then some parts of chapter 6 this morning. So let's, let's look at this together, Joshua chapter 2. And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into an harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, There came two men unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting of the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whither the men went, I wot not, means I don't know. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house, and hid them with stalks of flax, which she had laid in order upon the roof. And the men pursued after them the way to Jordan and under the fords. And as soon as they which pursued after them were gone out, they shut the gate." And before they were laid down, she came up unto them upon the roof, and she said unto them, uh, unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that the, your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side Jordan, Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Now therefore, I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house and give me a true token, and that you will save alive my father and my mother and my brethren and my sisters and all that they have and deliver our lives from death. And the men answered her, our life for yours, if ye utter not this our business. And it shall be when the Lord hath given us the land that we will deal kindly and truly with thee. And then she let them down by a cord through the window, for her house was upon the town wall, and she dwelt upon the wall. 
And she said unto them, Get you to the mountain and let the pursuers meet you, and hide yourselves there three days until the pursuers be returned, and afterward may you go your way. And the men said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath which thou hast made us swear. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window which thou didst let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father and thy mother and thy brethren and all thy father's household home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the street, his blood shall be upon his head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be upon our head, if any hand be upon him. And if thou utter this our business, then we will be quit of thine oath, which thou hast made us to swear. And she said, According unto your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed. And she bound the scarlet line in the window, and they went and came unto the mountain and abode there three days until the pursuers were returned. And the pursuers sought them throughout all the way, but found them not. So the two men returned and descended from the mountain and passed over and came to Joshua, the son of Nun, and told him all the things that befell them. And they said unto Joshua, Truly the Lord hath delivered into our hands all the land, for even all the inhabitants of the country do faint because of us. Now turn a page or two over to chapter 6. Don't worry, we're not going to read the whole chapter, okay? But uh, I wanted to read all of that chapter for you. And I want you to notice in chapter 6. <clears throat> now Jericho was straightly shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said unto Joshua, See, I have given into thine hand Jericho, and the king thereof, and the mighty men of valor. And ye shall compass the city, all ye men of war, and go round about the city once. Thus shalt thou do six days. And seven priests shall bear before the ark seven trumpets of ram's horns. And the seventh day ye shall compass the city seven times. And the priests shall blow with the trumpets. And it shall come to pass that when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when ye hear the sound of the trumpet, all the people shall shout with a great shout, and the wall of the city shall fall down flat, and the people shall ascend up every man straight before him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this a story from many thousands of years ago and you've given it to us in your word and it has an intended purpose. And so Lord, I pray that you'd help us as we learn it and understand the point for today. And Lord, I pray that you'd work in the hearts of each one of us as we consider not just the great story, but the truth that's uh, meant, that it's meant to tell. Lord, I do ask if there's anyone here today who has never put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, that they would be born again today that they'd, they would know what the forgiveness is that only you can offer for their sin. So please work to that end, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. When you read the Old Testament, what you're reading is a canvas upon which the portraits of Jesus Christ have been painted. That is the story of the Old Testament. So often we read through the Scriptures and we see the Old Testament, and if we're not careful, we'll think to ourselves... Well, this is just the story of some religious history that has no meaning or purpose in my life today. But I'm here to tell you that the stories that you read, as we've read this morning, and many others, they're all pictures on the canvas that point us to Jesus Christ. And the story that we've read, particularly in chapter 2, before the wall ever came down, is the story of a woman named Rahab. <clears throat> Rahab is one of the great types in the Bible and in the Bible, we use that word types, meaning they're pictures that are, are meant to portray something. It is an event, or it is an item, or it is something that God has put into Scripture. And oftentimes we see things and we don't understand, well, why was it given to us this way? Or why was it decided it had to look this way? Or to be this particular shape or this particular color? And then when you get into the New Testament and you see the life of the Lord Jesus Christ you understand why God did what He did those many thousands of years ago. Because the Old Testament, as I said, it's a canvas. And upon that canvas are many, many pictures all pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the life of Rahab. Rahab, if we were to look back in chapter number 2, Rahab was a harlot. Rahab was a sinful woman. In any generation, in virtually any culture of our world, it has been understood that, that a particular woman of that color a woman of that, uh, of that lifestyle was, uh, was a, a lesser woman. It was a wicked lifestyle, and everybody knew what that was. But we see the picture of Rahab here and what it was in her life that really shows us the redemption and the grace that's found in Jesus Christ. And that's the story I want to tell for you this morning. Now, you'd be familiar, of course, with what took place in Joshua chapter 6. 
I want you to picture with me Joshua, this great general. He had, he had fought battles prior to this. I mean, he'd fought battles with his sword. Joshua was one that was down with the children of Israel fighting as the general uh, overthrowing Amalek. And you remember the story where Moses was on the top of the mountain overlooking the armies as they fought. And Moses had to raise his staff up on high. Do you remember the story? And as long as the staff of God was raised over that valley as they fought below, then Israel prevailed. But if the staff was lowered, then what happened? Then Israel began to falter in the battle. And so we have Aaron and Hur, these two men who stood on either side of Moses, and they held up his arms until the going down of the sun. So Moses' arm was up high, and as long as the, the arm was high, then they prevailed over Amalek. And so the story goes, and so the battle went where Joshua prevailed. Now you can imagine Joshua knew that when he came into the promised land, he didn't know how it was going to be that they were going to cross this river, but here's what Joshua knew. He was there when they crossed the Red Sea. He had no problem understanding that God could part the sea so God could part a river. So Joshua no doubt figured that unless God was going to row a fleet of ships down the Jordan River, that somehow or another he was going to stop the waters so that the nation could go through. I don't think this would have been any stretch in Joshua's mind. But no doubt as the general who had lived through and fought uh, very successfully these battles up to this point, Joshua no doubt had thought that he was going to go into Jericho and overthrow the city in the traditional way. Joshua would have had no inkling of what God was going to do here. And so we read those first few verses of chapter 6 where the Lord said to Joshua, now this is what's going to happen for you, Joshua. You're going to get everybody in battle ready to go. And I want everybody to circle that city, but here's what's going to happen. For six days, the army's just going to circle the city one time. And nobody's going to say a word. I don't want your swords drawn. I don't want anybody having a conversation. Nobody's shouting at the people that are up on top of the wall. There's just going to be the Ark of the Covenant of God. It's going to lead the way. The, the ram's horns are going to be blowing. And nobody's going to say a word. And you're going to circle the city one time. Now, now, brethren, Jericho was not that big of a place. As we look at archaeology today, they have been numbers of digs since the early 1900s, even prior to that, that have confirmed where the ancient city of Jericho was. The entire city, they estimate, was upon about nine acres. That's not a very big portion of ground. It would have been upon a tell, which was a, a hill. That's what a, a hill is called, a big mound, a natural mound. And the city was built there on top of this mound. And so it was fairly small in its circumference. And you could imagine the multiple thousands of the army circling this city. It wouldn't have taken very long for everybody to go around one time. So Joshua was listening to God tell him this. And I don't know what obviously was going through Joshua's mind. But he's probably thinking something along the lines of, well, this is unusual. And so for six days... The army of Israel circles the city one time, and nobody says a word. On the seventh day, the Bible tells us in chapter 6 that they rise up at about the breaking of the day, and Joshua had commanded the army, this is what's going to happen. You remember the last six days. Well, guys, guess what? More exercise today. On the seventh day, we're going to circle the city seven times. And when we get to the last time, you're going to hear the trumpets blow, and then here's what's going to happen. The Lord is going to bid you to shout. And when you shout, the walls are going to fall down. And you won't have to do anything except for go over the rubble and into the city. Now, of course, they were going to fight. No doubt the swords were out, but they weren't going to have to topple the wall down. God said, I'll take care of that for you. And so they went. And so they conquered the city. That's what took place in Jericho. But ju just days before that, these two spies had come into the city. They were going to spy out what it was, the, the lay of the land, uh, what the city was like, the inhabitants, the people. This was a very customary thing that they would do. It was the forward observer that would go in and spy out the enemy territory. It was probably completely unnecessary since God was going to drop the walls down anyway. But God had a great plan in this story because it introduces us to this harlot named Rahab. I want you to consider with me the story of Rahab as we've read in chapter number 2 here. Obviously, Rahab is a Gentile of Jericho. And Rahab was a, was a woman of, of Jericho as a Gentile that was estranged from Israel. She had no connection to Israel. She did not have Jewish blood. You understand? She was completely uh, apart from the nation of Israel. She was a harlot. Now, although she was not subject to the law of God that God had given to Moses, if we were to look at God's law that he had just laid out for the children of Israel some years prior to this, we would have found out that her profession as a prostitute, uh, she was guilty of death for her lifestyle. In the book of Deuteronomy in chapter number 22, you don't need to turn there, but God had spoken of, of a similar account here, speaking of a woman that had lived this type of life. 
It says that they would bring the damsel out of the door of her father's house and the men of the city shall stone her with stones that she die because she hath wrought folly in Israel to play the whore in her father's house. And God said, so shalt thou put away the evil from among you. And God took a lifestyle like this very seriously. And so she was certainly guilty under God's law of death and condemnation. But if you're looking in chapter number two, when she has a conversation with these two spies, she went up to them on the roof. And here's what she said in verse number nine. If you look in your Bible, she said, I know that the Lord hath given you into the land, given you the land. Now, it's interesting. She said, I know. She comes up to the roof where the spies are hidden and she says to the guys, guys, here's what I know. As a woman of Jericho, I know that God has given you this land. She said in verse number nine, and your terror is fallen upon us. So she said, here's what I know, but your terror has fallen upon all of us as a city. All of us as the people of Jericho, it's fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land, they faint because of you, for we have heard how the Lord dried up the waters of the Red Sea for you. I've often wondered how it is she heard. Who was around that particular day 40 years ago when the nation of Israel came across? Now, we know the Egyptian army was around, but there were no survivors. There was nobody left to tell the tale. But somewhere along the journey, word got across the Jordan River that the nation of Israel had come across through the Red Sea. And she said, we heard about it. She said, when you came out of Egypt. And then she said, we heard what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of Jordan. So she's saying to the spies, across the river on the other side of Jordan, where you came from, were, were Og and who's the other one? And, and Sihon, we, we heard what you did to those two kings. These were savage, mighty kings, and you'd utterly destroyed them. And we heard about that. So what she's saying is, as soon as we heard these things, verse 11, our heart did melt, neither did there remain any more courage in any man because of you. Now notice what she says, look in your Bible. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Amen. At some point along the line, as she had heard these stories and considered what had happened with this nation, she had faith in a God she didn't know. And she says, here's what I know. We know that the Lord your God, He is God. Oh, I understand that the gods of all the nations around and the gods of Jericho and maybe how I was brought up and what I was told to believe as a child growing up in this city. But here's what I know now because of what I've seen and heard. I know that the God you serve is the one and true God. And she had faith in the God of Israel. You might say, well, how do you know she had faith? Because if you were to turn into Hebrews in chapter number 11, you would see this statement that was made of Rahab many, many thousands of years later. It says, by faith, the harlot Rahab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. By faith. Here's this Gentile woman, wicked woman, who had faith in God. And so they have a conversation and she says, please, I've showed you kindness. So here's what I'm asking in return. Would you please just deliver me? And not just me, but my, my brothers and sisters and my mother and father, my whole extended family, would you deliver us from the destruction that is sure to come to our city? And they said, well, this is what we'll do then. We'll deliver you, but here's what you need to do. In verse number 18 of this chapter, looking again, Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread in the window, which thou didst let us down by, and then they said, you bring your father, mother, brethren, and the father's household into this. Down to verse number 21. She said, according to your words, so be it. And she sent them away and they departed. And she bound the scarlet line in the window. What was this? Well, it was the promise of deliverance from judgment. And you know what that scarlet thread, that scarlet cord, that scarlet rope coming down out of the window had to be? It had to be on the house. Now, again, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, this would ring a bell of familiarity to you, would it not? As we consider what took place in Egypt those many years ago, just as the Passover in Exodus, when Israel was delivered from the land of Egypt, God said to the people, you stay inside your house and that lamb that you've killed, I want you to take the blood of that lamb and you strike it on the, on the sides and the top post of the door of your house. That red blood had to be on the outside so that the destroying angel would pass over your house and not judge you and kill you. Very similar to that. That blood had to be visible from the outside. And that cord that she hung out the, the window of her house 
Remember now, we read that her house was up against that outer wall. Now, the book, uh, the, the book of Jericho tells us about the city, and there were, there were two walls that were on this city. At the ground level, there was a wall that would have been about six or seven feet thick, about 15 feet high or so, from what archaeology can show us. And then there was a, a large gap between that and the, the inner wall, which was at the top of the hill uh, where the city was. And that wall was much thicker and much higher, and Rahab's house was built at the outer wall. Her house was built at the outer wall. And they've learned in archaeology now that in between the two walls were houses that had been built in the, in the gap, sort of the dead space between the two walls, as well as the city at the top. Her house was there, and so she hung that scarlet rope or that line out of the window. It says that she bound the scarlet line in the window, and that cord became her hope that the promise that they made would be fulfilled, and that cord had to be in the window. And so if you look at chapter 6, <clears throat> where I'd asked you to be a moment ago, uh, the Lord does, in fact, do what he told Joshua that he would do. And the walls come down. And it says in verse number 20 there that they, they blew the trumpet, the people shouted with a great shout, and that the walls fell down flat so that the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city. Look at verse 22. Joshua had said unto the two men that had spied out the country, Go into the harlot's house, and bring out thence the woman, and all that she hath as, she swear under her, as ye swear unto her. And the young men that were spies went in, and they brought out Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren, and all that she had, and they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. Notice verse 25, And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive and her father's household and all that she had. And she dwelleth in Israel even unto this day because she hid the messengers which Joshua sent to spy out Jericho. You see, Rahab was saved from death, wasn't she? So the story goes that the, the spies said, Well, you hang this scarlet rope, this line in the window. And then when we come to over, overthrow this city because God has delivered this city into our hands, we're going to come and we're going to spare your house. As long as you're in that house where the scarlet line hangs from the window, you will be delivered from death. And so by faith, she hung that line out the window, believing not only in God, but in the word of the messengers, and she was saved from death. Now it's interesting, if you'll turn with me to the book of First Chronicles in chapter 2. 1 Chronicles and chapter number 2. Turn there with me. This is uh, one of those several chapters uh, <clears throat> that you read in the Bible. The, uh, the first nine chapters is what we generally skip over in our Bible reading, right? Come on, you know the truth of this. And so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so, right? All right, let's, on a show of hands, how many of you skip over this in your normal Bible reading? Thank you, God bless you for your honesty. There's only one honest person in the whole church this morning, okay? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I want you to notice 1 Chronicles chapter 2, and I want you to look with me at verse number 10. It says, And Ram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nashon, prince of the children of Judah, and Nashon begat Salma, and Salma begat Boaz. That name sound familiar? And Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and who was Jesse's son? David, David the king. Now, that was in 1 Chronicles chapter 2. I want you to turn over to me to Matthew chapter 1 real quickly, and then we'll come back to Joshua. Matthew chapter number 1. This is the first book in the New Testament. Thank you for turning there. Matthew chapter number 1. This is the genealogy, the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ through Joseph. Matthew chapter number 1, and I want you to look with me at verse number 4. And Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nashon, or Nashon, and Nashon begat Solomon, and Solomon begat Boaz of Rahab, of Rahab. And Boaz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king. It's interesting. If you go back to Joshua chapter 2 then, she was delivered with her family, from certain death because she hung the scarlet line out the window and she eventually married she eventually married a Jewish man it's interesting isn't it it's a picture she married a, a man named Salmon not Salmon but Salmon right and he was called a prince of Israel a prince of the children of Judah like his father 
And we learn in Matthew chapter 1 that Salmon had a wife named Rahab. So what did Rahab do after she was delivered from this certain death in her city? Well, she forsook her old life and she married a Jewish man. And it's a great picture of a Gentile getting saved and and marrying, if you will, the Lord Jesus Christ. In Romans in chapter 7, Paul talks about this where he said, Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even him who is raised from the dead. That's Jesus Christ, isn't it? That we should bring forth fruit unto God. And so Rahab became the mother of Boaz, the great-great-grandmother of David, in the line of the Lord Jesus Christ through Joseph. Now, I wonder if you can see the portrait that the Lord is painting of himself in this story. You see, we too were Gentiles and we were separated from God and it was not by our lineage, but it was by the fact we had no new birth. We were separated from God. Paul talks about this in the book of Ephesians and chapter 2 where he says, Wherefore remember that ye being in the time past Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcision by that which is called circumcision in the flesh. So in other words, the Jewish people called you the uncircumcision. He said that at that time, ye were without Christ, Paul said, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. That's the way we were. And like Rahab, our lives were filled with sin and wickedness. Oh, maybe not to the same extent. Maybe it was not the same lifestyle that Rahab had. And yet God says in Galatians in chapter 3, but the scripture hath concluded all under sin. And in Ecclesiastes in chapter 7, this great book of the Bible, for there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. And again in Colossians in chapter 1, Paul says this. He says, and you that were sometimes, meaning you used to be, alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. You see, that's the way we used to be as Rahab, our lives filled with sin and wicked living. And we were all guilty in our sin and deserving of death, just like Rahab was for her lifestyle. Now we know that whatsoever things the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and that all the world may become guilty before God. Romans in chapter number 3. All the world is guilty. You're here today without Jesus Christ. I'm here to tell you as a friend, you're guilty in your sin. You're not guilty toward me. You're guilty toward God. You have sinned against God as all of us have sinned. The Bible says in the book of James, in chapter 2, For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. You say, well, I've been a pretty good guy. Well, a pretty good guy is not going to get you to heaven. I've kept nine out of the ten commandments. Well, it's that one that's going to send you to hell. And the truth of the matter is, when we look at the law as it is with all of the law of God, you and I are guilty of breaking all of it. We're guilty of all of it. For the wages of sin is death. And just as Rahab was, we are guilty of death because of our sin. But what happened with Rahab? Well, she trusted in the one true God. She had faith to believe in that God. The one she hadn't seen, the one she'd never worshipped, she'd never seen his ark, she'd never understood the law of God, as far as we know. And yet, as a Gentile woman, she knew of the God of Israel and what he had done, and she had faith in the God of Israel. And so we, though we were guilty in, in our sin and worthy of our death, we trusted in the one living and true God by faith. And what was our faith resting in? You see, there's no string of scarlet Today, there's no thread to hang out the window of our house. What do we have today? We have the blood of Christ, which is God's perfect sacrifice for our sin, the blood of Christ. That's the picture. That thread that hung out the window of our house that day is a picture of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what it's for. And we have in the Word of God this wonderful statement in the book of Isaiah in chapter 1, where here's what the Lord says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. He said, I'll take care of that for you. It's my blood that will wash away your sin. I wonder if you can see the love and mercy of God, as Peter talked about in the book of 1 Peter in chapter 1. You know these verses, For as much as you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, 
received, he says, by your vain conversations, uh, by tradition from your fathers. In other words, you were, you were raised to believe that there were certain things that could atone for your sin, but you haven't received forgiveness that way. He said, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. That scarlet line that hung out the window, a picture of the blood of Jesus Christ as the only way of man's redemption. There's nothing else you can hang out the window of your life. You can't hang a rope out the window of your life that says good works and church membership and baptism. Well, my dad was a Baptist preacher. Well, I was raised in a Christian home. All of those things won't get you to heaven. They won't deliver you from the death and destruction and judgment you deserve because of the guilt of your sin. Jesus Christ alone. And so just as God passed over His people who had the blood applied to the doorposts of their house. The Bible tells us that He passes over us who have been washed in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Revelation in chapter 1, that great picture of Christ. It says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto Him that loved us and washed us from our sins with His own blood. Amen. People have accused Christianity of being a bloody religion, and right they are. Right they are. It was the blood of Jesus Christ that was necessary to wash us from our sin. We sing these songs of the faith and people will come into church and they have no idea why we're singing about blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And they sit and listen to these songs and we rejoice in what we sing. But can you understand to the world what a strange thing this is as we're singing about blood? You understand it's not a human sacrifice we're talking about here. We're talking about the sacrifice that God made of His own self for the sin of the world. And He painted this picture of His redemption in the story of Rahab. Then there's only one thing that could deliver. It was the scarlet thread. And so, we believed. And just like Rahab, we were saved from judgment. Were we not? We were saved from eternal death and judgment. Paul said it this way in Romans in chapter 6. He said, But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and to the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. You know what that is, brethren? That's deliverance from sin and judgment. You have not been appointed to wrath. You have been delivered from the future judgment that you deserved because you put your faith and trust in the shed blood and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Rahab is a picture of that. The Apostle John said in 1 John chapter 2, and this is the promise that He hath promised us, even eternal life. It's a promise. The Apostle said in Acts in chapter 13, and by Him all that believe are justified from all things. You couldn't be justified or made just, declared to be just and righteous. You could not be justified by the law of Moses, but if you believe in Jesus Christ, you're justified from all things. Not just a few things. You don't have anything else you have to atone for. It's all things. That's your past, your present, and thank God it's your future. You're justified from all things. What, what justified you? The blood of Jesus Christ. You see, we are now freemen. We're not in bondage to our sin. We're not enslaved to our sin and idolatry. No, no more. We're not under the curse of sin. The ruin that sin could bring in our life, we're no longer under that curse. We're delivered. Hey, we're called by a new name. We are now placed into the body of Jesus Christ, the family of God, by the new birth. That's what we are. We're no longer Jew or Gentile. We're the church of God. We're the espoused bride of Jesus Christ, the bridegroom whom He purchased by His blood, and we are forever safe in His mighty hand. Do you see the story? As God gives us these stories as believers, you know what this is? This is us retelling the old, old story. This is you and I that are born again, looking back at a portrait like this in the Bible and thinking to ourselves, if God could take a person like that and not only save and deliver her from certain death, but put her into the lineage of Jesus Christ, what could God do in my life? And we remember back to when God saved us. We remember back to when we heard the gospel. We rejoice in the fact somebody came and shared the gospel with us and that God convicted our heart and we repented of our sin. We rejoice in the fact that He gave us the faith to believe the truth of the Word of God and the fact that Christ died for our sins and rose again the third day. We rejoice in all of that, don't we? It's, it's a message today of hope 
in encouragement and rejoicing and a remembrance of the things past of what God had done in our life. But I wonder if you're here today and you realize that in, in a picture there is still today a scarlet thread available to you. Oh, it's not something you tie into the, the window of your house. But it is the blood of Jesus Christ that is still available today to wash you from your sins. There's so much confusion in the world today about what it is to go to heaven. If you were to talk to the average person today, they would give you the average answer today. Well, I'm a pretty good person. I'm just going to take my chances. That's your typical Aussie expression. I'm just going to take my chances. I can't tell you how many times an Australian man has said that to me. I'm just going to roll the dice and take my chances. I don't, I'm not really worried about it. You better be worried about it. Amen. You better be concerned about it. If it was of no concern, then God would not have been concerned enough to send His only begotten Son into the world to save sinners. But if it's a concern to the God who created you, don't you think it should be a concern to you? Amen. Because you have an eternal soul that God breathed into you. And that eternal soul will spend somewhere for all of eternity. And because of sin, as we've read, for all have sinned, your soul is in danger of judgment. And the blood of Jesus Christ is available today. It's amazing, isn't it, that after 2,000 years, it's still available to wash you from your sin. If you'll put your faith in, in Jesus Christ. And we who are saved rejoice in what God has done for us, but we desire for you, if you're here today without Christ, we desire for you that you would know the forgiveness that only can be offered through Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's not a system of good works, as many, many people who profess to be Christians will say. It's not evidenced by certain things in your life, as if you have to do certain things to be saved or to stay saved. It is purely a matter of faith in Jesus Christ alone. It's not 90% you, or 90% God and 10% you. It's not 99% God and 1% you. It's faith in Jesus Christ alone, the all-sufficient God who gave himself as a sacrifice for your sin. And that's available to you today. And God wants you to understand that today you have the opportunity to receive him as your Savior. Now here's what that means. You have to forsake your sin. And by that I simply mean this. You have to recognize that you are a sinner in the sight of God and you deserve the judgment that God said you deserve. And you must say, I am, I'm repenting of that, meaning I realize that the direction I've been going is wrong and what the Bible says is right. And so I'm turning by faith to Jesus Christ so that I can be born again. There's some people that say, well, I have to do certain good things in order that I might be saved. It's like the al alcoholic who says, well, once I get rid of this booze problem, then I'm okay to get saved. God doesn't say you reform yourself in order to be saved. God says you get saved and I will reform you. And when the Spirit of God comes into you and He begins to change you, those things that you used to do and the way that you used to be, it is transformed and changed because if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. And so if you're here today and you've got a lifestyle of sin and wickedness and you say, I have no problem admitting that I'm a sinner, but I just think I need to change this, that, and the other before I can come to Jesus Christ, you've missed the mark. You don't change anything. You just realize I'm turning my back on that. I'm putting my faith in Jesus Christ. That stuff is going to send me to hell and there's nothing that I can do about it. There's a lot of people that try to reform their character, reform their sin in order to get saved. And what God is simply saying is you put your faith in Christ and repent of all of that and I'll change your life. Yeah. And so, it's available to you today. You see, God the judge will deliver you in His mercy. Amen. God the judge will forgive you for your sin. Yeah. But it has to be God's way. And this is the rub for so many. It has to be God's way. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but it's according to His mercy that He saved us. Yeah. The mercy of God. So the call for you today as a, a guest or visitor here today is, have you put your faith in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation? Or are you still trying to do good enough so that you can be accepted by God? Are you trusting in the religious works of your own hands as so many in the world are? You pick the major religions of the world and they all have one thing in common. I have to do this, I have to do this, and I have to do this. And there's a longer list than three. It's a whole lifestyle of doing, doing, doing. And even then they have no confidence that that was enough to get to heaven. Or as we who believe the scriptures understand, Jesus Christ already did it all on the cross. And we just turn by faith to Christ and say, I can't save myself, but you can save me. 
You see, only God can forgive your sin. And he offers that to you freely this morning. I wonder, would you put your faith in Jesus Christ today? I want to give you an opportunity to do that today if you're not saved. Would you bow your head with me and close your eyes as we have a word of prayer together? 